we're very delighted to have Dominic Searle here with us this morning. Um, Dominic has for many years been a journalist in Gibraltar and then most recently he is the head of the UK or the Gibraltar representation to the UK. And Gibraltar, um, as I think most of you know, is the other pending external EU border uh, of the UK because Gibraltar is an overseas territory and we sometimes, uh, when we're talking about our unique circumstances, forget that uh, Gibraltar also has unique circumstances, but also that we share many of the same issues. They're very, in fact, um, I think maybe people would be aware of, though they have a much smaller population um, than here in the north of Ireland, they voted 96% to remain. Um, so that was a reflection of, of their geographical location and a whole lot of other issues in terms of the concerns that people there would have around the economy. They're very dependent on cross-border workers from Spain and also in that sense, the economy of the adjacent border region uh, on the Spanish side is also very dependent on free movement of people and goods and services between Gibraltar and, and Spain. So they do share a lot of, of the same issues, ish problems around European funding programs, all of that. Um, but anyway, Dominic, I think, will talk much more eloquently than I can about that. But just to say, we hope um, that this is the beginning, again, of, of much more dialogue with, with Gibraltar, that we both can, can ensure that our voices are heard, however um, it may be difficult without a government speaking for the people of the North of Ireland at the moment but that we do make our voices heard and our concerns reflected and addressed in the negotiations going forward. So, Dominic, I'm very glad to welcome you here. Um, just to, to reinforce that, I, I prefer to speak not as the government rep, because having been a, a hack for, for 30 years, um, it's sort of my role in the government anyway is to slightly go against the grain and, and try and change the, their views. Um, I'm not an academic, um, but I, uh, and I don't pretend to know about Northern Ireland particularly well. We did come out in November to see Straban and Derry and meet with officials on both sides of the, of the border just to get ideas and understand it. And there are things in common, um, and I think as you look at it closer, there are also very specifically different um, issues. Um, the first thing I wanted to do, if I can have the first slide up. Um, was give you a sense of the geography, because I think if you have that, um, it will help as I go along. If you look beyond the rock, what you're seeing at the straight ahead, because the rock is like an almost perfectly north-south, that's Morocco, but it's in fact, as you go to the side, you see a little island, but it's not actually an island, and that's Sota. That is <laughs> Spanish Morocco. That is actually integrated Spain on the Moroccan coast. Moroccans claim Sota and Malaysia, and in fact, every time Spain makes some pronouncement towards Gibraltar, you'll get an equivalent pronouncement from the Moroccans towards Spain. So there's a little sort of game going on all the time. If you look ac across there, that's the Strait of Gibraltar. So the Mediterranean is on the left uh, as we look at it, and the, the um, Atlantic is on the right. And the little piece of land where you see the Moroccan coast uh, between them, uh, right on the edge, that is Al that's the tip of Algeciras. Um, and Tarifa. That is actually the point where, for decades, the issue of migrants coming across in boats and smuggling has been huge because it was largely military uh, land uh, and occupied by the military. If you step forward, um, you'll see at the bottom of the rock, the, in front of it, there's the runway. That, that is, if you're not used to uh, landing at Gibraltar, there's a bit of excitement as you start a holiday there. Um, and I, I want, if, you, if you see towards the end, that's actually a large, that's the cemetery. Now, the Spaniards would say that the cemetery is in Spain uh, that this, because all that land there will come to is what, what they've considered a second sovereignty dispute. So just to, the quick history is Utrecht in 1713 ceded the fortress, what they consider the fortress and the harbor, but they say that the isthmus, which was, came over time, and the waters were not ceded in 1713. That is at the base of, the, of some of the difficulties we have and which goes to the heart of what, how borders and what, what borders are. It's a fairly straight line. If you go to the edge of the, of the runway, you see that, that there's a road because you actually drive at the moment. There's, they're building a tunnel on the end, but at the moment, you still drive across the runway to go in and out from Spain 
uh, into, into Gibraltar, through Gibraltar. So the end of that road is where the border is. And the border is just a classic fence right across there. It's been there since the beginning of the last century um, with, with a razor wire across it. Um, every now and then there's some holes appear in it and they have to fix it. Um, but basically it's controlled by one entrance, which is about as wide as this room, which is for cars. On the side of that, there are um, pedestrian exit and entrance, and then there's a commercial uh, and, uh, customs post, which only runs from um, more, nine in the morning to nine at night. So that straight line, if, I don't know if you can see that building that looks a bit like a jigsaw puzzle right in the center by the border, okay? Now, we'll come to that, but that ends very abruptly. That is because that was the airport when things, when relationships were good, we, uh, we stuck to our side of the deal and built a terminal. They were supposed to build an entrance on the other side, and they would have been able to have flights from Madrid to Gibraltar without having to go through customs. Uh, it was a bit like Baal Airport, that sort of thing. Uh, a right-wing government came into power in Spain, and they just reneged on the deal, so you've got this strange airport that cuts off, and when you go into the airport, you take a very long walk to go around because it was designed to avoid the sorts of problems that I know that you in Northern Ireland will understand. Um, population is 32,000. We're 6.7 six square, uh, 6 square kilometers. The Campo de Gibraltar, which is the land, that's La Línea, the rest of the town where you see the, the, right at the front, goes right round in the bay. That is seven municipalities. Those seven mun municipalities are 300,000 people, 500 square kilometers. That's the difference in size. They're 10 times the, the population and, and, and much larger in geographical size. I'm trying to get rid of the stats first, so if you, if you bear with me, then I, I don't want to sort of go on with stats all the time. But it's important because at the moment, 13,000 workers cross the border every day. Remember that it's 32,000 population. Gibraltar produces 27,000 jobs. Of those workers, 7,733, 7, I think, are Spanish EU, i.e. Spaniards who cross the border to work officially. I say officially because that means that they're getting benefits, they're paying tax. Um, you've got another two to 3,000 who come in to do gardening, uh, to do um, you know, nannying work, that sort of thing, maybe cleaning in houses, that, that, that kind of work but officially 7,000. Um, UK nationals living on the Spanish side coming through is 2,500. And I just thought I'd pick up the figure, 151 Irish. I'm not sure what, what, quite what they do, but we do have an Irish town in the center of, of, of Gibraltar. So the bulk of, of, of those workers coming in are EU workers of those 13,000. And um, if you think about it, they're, leave, they're going to be leaving the EU every day so they're going to be UK nationals living in the EU, leaving the EU to work every day and go back. We don't have a migration issue. We have, it, our problem is going to be that we need migrant workers. And of course, they need us. That is the other side of it. This is, if you took the examples of what the EU was supposed to do, the EU was supposed to get us to work together in order to create a symbiotic uh, relationship so that whatever one side does, the other side benefits and, and so forth. So there you had work produced in one of the poorest areas of Spain, 40% unemployment, 50% youth unemployment. And Jib, we, don't, we, had, we actually don't have unemployment only because we're bringing in so much labor. Um, Gibraltar accounts for 25% of the GDP of the Campo de Gibraltar. So that is, and that's all part of Cadiz, part of Andalusia. So 25% of their GDP is produced by us. Um, when they, we did a, a, a surveys, we, we spent a huge amount of money uh, buying from them. But we're also, the, if you treat Gibraltar as a sort of corporation, um, we would be the second largest employer in the whole of Andalusia. So what have we got as a result of that? Uh, we've got unions, co chambers of commerce talking to each other, all of them on both sides of the border saying we can't allow Brexit to stop this fluidity. So I'll get to back to the meaning of that uh, a bit later, but I thought that was a useful um, sense of, of, of what we have. Uh, if we go to the, I, I could give you some more stats. I mean, on cars, I just I mentioned the cars because I, I thought this was quite interesting. You've got, I, I gather from the, the public information that you've got 1.8 million cars crossing 
the the um, the border here uh, in a year. Um, we have about, we've got about sorry about fifteen percent of that. I mean, but we're that much smaller. But nonetheless, you know, we get we get three million cars coming through the border every year, and eleven million visitors to Gibraltar every year. That's a huge amount of, 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 of movement. Um, it's reduced in recent years because of some problems. A lot of citizens would actually say that's not a bad thing because uh, when you've got a, a, an attractive tourist spot like Gibraltar, um, you do get a lot of coaches that come with sandwiches and they don't pay for anything, they just walk around and see it and it actually becomes difficult for local citizens to, to, to live their own, their own lives. Now, Jib has been out, outside of the, it has been in, in the EU since 73. We've always had a hard border. So when people talk about hard and soft borders, we were, we were out of the customs union um, from the very start. Why was that? Because the border had closed in 1969. We suddenly had a, a, a sort of panic situation as to where we could um, purchase goods from. If we had been put into the customs union and agricultural policy, we would have had a problem surviving because we had, had to port everything from third countries. Um, Spain had cut us off uh, completely. And, um, you know, basically, <coughs> you, you couldn't survive uh, uh, in, in a place like Gibraltar uh, without having that uh, exemption. So that exemption created the fact that we still have to stop at the, at the customs point. Um, if we can go to the, to the next slide. Right. I thought I'd show you this is just a curious one because a, a little bit of history about the, about the borders as, as they existed. After the capture in 1704, uh, basically the whole thing was consolidated in, in the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. Now, amongst the various things that they did was one, define beyond the sort of fortress which was defined in the, in the treaty itself, the Brits argued and maintained, and, and in history maintained, that it was the distance that two cannonballs would fire that defined the sort of no man's land perimeters, that, that, that couldn't be um, interchanged there. Um, the fence then appears much later, at the beginning of, of the last century. Um, and what you'd had in between all that, obviously, was different periods of, of violence and, uh, and peace. I mean, most of, the, most of the 18th century was the sieges. Um, which really, in a sense, defined the, the, the Rock's Fortress. I mean, the investment in military terms in Gibraltar is the equivalent of the nuclear program that you have nowadays with Trident or something like that, because mm. the, just the cost of that, 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 that they put into, into defending it. And obviously, it was because it was one of the main trading routes. Um, in 1727, the, 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 the La Linea built... The, the, uh, La Linea is named after the line, which is what La Linea means. And they built a, a, a wall and defences on, on their side. So you start getting the definition, if you like, of, of the border. But then um, it was destroyed by the Brits in, in, in 1801. In 1805, they, there was a, a, a yellow fever, um, which is of, of consequence on two points. One, for, for the newspaper that I edited, which was started in 1801, it was the only time we stopped production because the entire printing works died. Um, but otherwise, what they did was they put camps out into that terrain, um, and that, in a sense, was a little bit again gaining sort of more solid uh, ground on 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 that area which had always been considered slightly nebulous in between both sides. So it's more a question of acquisition is is, is the argument there. And then by th by the time you get to the World Wars, it starts becoming very important. World War Two, it it becomes an airport. And you, you know, you'll see pictures of it um, absolutely covered uh, in aeroplanes, and it was a, a key point for the invasion of, of North Africa. So if we could go to the next, the next uh, slide there, yeah. That gives you an impression of what it's like right now. Um, so you, that's, that's the, the main uh, entrance point. And if, I mean, there's, I hear debates about electronics. We have the electronics now, so we have uh, face recognition, we have the um, plate reading, Spaniards have the plate reading, they put in um, the, the sort of passport readers and that. Nothing is faster than the human being. So you, you can be sure that at the end of the day, 
for all the technology, it's still going to be a problem if we rely totally on, on technology under the Schengen rules. Um, Spain you know, could actually, if it wanted to be, and it has been in the past, could become very awkward. The situation at the moment um, is not bad. It's probably the border is probably the most fluid it's been for quite a while. You could speculate as to why that's been continued, but the essence of it was that about four years ago, when there was a very um, quite sort of very right wing and quite uh, sort of obsessed uh, Spanish foreign minister called Garcia Margallo, uh, whose father had been one of Franco's soldiers and just had a sentiment about the rock. Um, he got very upset when complying with our, our protection of the environment, we created an artificial reef because Spanish fishermen, as you know, were quite sort of aggressive um, in our waters. Uh, that set off a, a huge dispute and we had 10 hour queues at the border. Uh, it was boiling hot, heart attacks, everything. You could, all of the things you can imagine can go wrong. And the, and the place becomes absolutely uh, paralyzed with it. Because of the many visitors and workers who are from the EU, two things happened. One, the, uh, David Cameron as Prime Minister actually called the Commission to have a look at the border. And thousands and thousands of citizens, not just of Gibraltar, but from all the EU, wrote a petition um, to the European Union <coughs> and said, look, you've got to have this done reasonably. Now, that three inspections came out. There was a lot of political maneuvering, but ultimately they had to publish it because it was a people's petition. And the result was that the Spaniards said, of course you can have border controls, but they have to be reasonable and they have to be proportionate. And that resulted in it actually working better than it because they spent two million pounds creating an electronic and uh, more complicated border. It actually works better than ever. I think, you know, to, to sort of ask what, what will happen with that now, the difference between now and 1969 is I don't think an EU government with democratic credentials, as, as much as we might complain about them in Gibraltar, can afford to put their own people out of work again. The last time they did that, most of La, La Linea was, a, was like a, a ghost town. I mean, I remember visiting it when the border was closed. It was a ghost town. And most of those Spaniards had gone either to Belgium or to the UK. Um, no one wants to see that again, and I don't think any modern government can approach a problem that way. Garcia Margallo, who, who left about a year and a half ago, did actually say, well, technically I can close the border. I, I don't think it's that simple. Um, we're an external border of the EU. The word border itself is contentious because um, the Spaniards insist that it's not a border or a frontier. They say it's a gate. So in, in their own arguments, it's a gate. If you go to the um, Spanish Foreign Ministry uh, website, you look at their documentation, they consider that Gibraltar, and they draw a red line around it, uh, is simply the fortress. So anything outside of that, they consider, was not ceded. And they've got, as I say, these, these two claims running. But people want to keep the border running. People want to keep the border fluid. So. I think the, the whole thing of Brexit um, brings to back to mind you know, the bad history we had. I mean, in 69, it wasn't just that the border closed. It was that the um, phone lines were cut off. It was that the um, only people who came through that border were dead, occasionally, They'd let because there were families. People are intermarried right across that border. I remember, um, I think if we can go up a bit, on the next slide, if you can. Uh, well, that, that just gives you a quick impression of, of what it was like in the, in, in the old days, sort of beginning of the last century. If you, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, that's it during the Civil War. So you get a, an impression of the sort of Spanish guards. and the, That one is actually a photograph of Republicans um, who were, and others who were trying to get into Gibraltar, and they were trying to control the, the numbers of people trying to get asylum, basically. Um, and we go to the next uh, slide. Right. This tells two different stories, which I'll get to, but the one on the right is what I remember as, a, as I was nine years old when that, when that happened. Those were the last Spanish workers going out. Everyone was crying when it happened. What you saw for the next 16 years um, with people, it, it was like, they used to call it the Skeletrics. I don't even remember those toys where the cars would keep going around. Well, that's what people did every Sunday. They'd get in their car 
and they'd go around the rock to see if something had happened. You know, I mean, it was really sort of because there was nowhere else to go. Uh, you were locked there, and then people would stop at the frontier, and the distance was quite, I mean, it was quite a distance. It was about 400 yards or something. And they'd call out to the families across the, across the gate. And so someone would be waving a baby, uh, everyone would be crying. Be that, that was daily seen in Gibraltar for a very long time. Um, and people, you know, were, were, were very resolute. At the same time, and I say this because I've met a number of MPs from, from the Northern Ireland and from Southern Ireland. I think, you know, this is where the differences uh, between Gibraltar and, and, and places like Northern Ireland come in the subtleties. Jib has two histories, if you like. One is the local population and its history with the British government as a colonial power. And then the complexities that we get into because we all intermarry and we're all one family. And then you've got the Spanish uh, claim over Gibraltar, um, which has been aggressive at times, and more political at others, or economical. Um, that sign is a throwback to the real, uh, that's the early 60s. And that is the toilet sign, which <laughs> separates the toilets for British workmen and everybody else. So you get a sense that these things, you know, it wasn't quite as simple. In the 70s, uh, a local teacher who had trained at the same teacher would be earning less than an expat teacher who'd come out. So, that, you know, that there's those complexities going on. But the binding force is the problem with Spain, because that is a, a, a complete economic threat. At the same time, going back to 1713, one of the, apart from deals on slavery, um, one of the things in the, in, the, in the Treaty of Utrecht is that we shouldn't have Moors or Jews in Gibraltar, which of course we did. It was, was always, had, and they stayed on. In fairness to, to British uh, pragmatism, Jews and Moors stayed on Gibraltar. They were very important for supplying the, the fortress, but they're there. Jib has been a multicultural society right through. It, you know, it's quite different now. You go to Spain and you see uh, people from all over the world, but actually even as far back, you know, as recent as the 80s, you went to a town in Spain, you saw Spaniards, full stop. That was it. I mean, you didn't see anybody else. So we've got a, a slightly different history, and that history works with a British government that has been progressive in its attitude towards it, its colonial people, not just us, but in, everywhere else in the world. That, I think, is the problem, in a sense, with the Spanish government. The Spanish government hasn't understood uh, human relationships, and every time you just use the border as a tap. And I've interviewed and know Spanish officials and politicians who, who admit that that's what they would do. You know, call it down, three hour queue, and that's it. And you, you throw everything into, into mayhem. That is, is, is a fundamental uh, problem with, with that, um, that situation. And I think that's, that's where I think at the moment the biggest fear for us uh, is that it would go back to that to be honest, I'm not so pessimistic. I think actually political forces in Spain are, are a little bit more complicated. Um, and I think actually their role in the EU will sort of, um, will help them get over that. But I think, and I'll sort of round off before I, I, I'll let you ask any questions if you like. I think the real issue when you look at these things is that most borders are not the technical or the physical ones. Those are the manifestations of the sort of mental borders that people uh, create between themselves. Um, it's fantastic in a way that with 11 million people visiting every year, most of them Spanish, most of the tourists are Spanish. In the, in the 30 years that I was running the paper and since, the, since the, the border opened, we've had one or two incidents of, you know, some extremist, well-known you know, well Spanish extremist climbing up to a castle and changing the Union Jack for a Spanish flag or something like that, people getting outraged. But actually, we don't have problems. Um, people in the surrounding area of Spain are very happy to work for us. If you look at the El País, I'm not sure if, if, if they've translated, because there is an El País, it's the main Spanish, uh, one of the main Spanish newspapers. Um, they had an article two, two weeks ago, um, which was, I thought, very telling. One, because it was done by a Spanish newspaper, um, and it was an interview with a Spanish worker in Gibraltar and a Moroccan worker in Sota. Now, the Moroccan worker only was interviewed on anonymously. She wouldn't have a <laughs> photograph taken. She was getting something like a quarter of the official wage. 
Um, she was very unhappy and very uncertain about her existence there. The Spanish worker spoke openly, very happy um, with, her, with her life working in Gibraltar, and actually said, you know, this is, she wants it to continue. So the last thing that she wants is that Brexit ends their quality of, of life. Now, if you, if you look at the, the workforce, it's a problem for us all. 25% of our nurses come in from Spain. About 25% of our medical staff in the hospital come in from Spain. And they come in not because they like us. They come in actually because they get good jobs there. They get actually more, often more permanent jobs in Gibraltar um, than they do in Spain. Spain has an issue with, with employment, so people tend to be on the sort of equivalent of a sort of zero contract a lot of the time. They need that to, to function. So I mean, we've reached a sort of stage where there are two issues that Gibraltar faces as existential. One is the economy, and one is the border, which is everything, including the economy. In terms of the economy, our biggest market is the UK. Our discussions are going well. The markets uh, uh, that we have with the UK will remain open. We've got to make up 10% of our income if Brexit is difficult. Um, and we'll have to find ways of doing that. But to be honest, people in Gibraltar uh, make hay when the sun shines and we've gone through sieges and we'll see sieges through. But the border, I think, would be existential for everyone, both sides of the border. And I think it would become quite an important um, signal to all of us who are discussing Brexit mm -hmm. as to how wrong things can go and quickly um, if we go down those routes. So. I think the, you know, the, the project is to create a basis of understanding. We certainly work as hard as we can with all the groups uh, across our border. Um, and I'd leave you with the thought that the, the real border is somewhere between Madrid and its inability to move away from history. Thank you. now for questions and discussion. Um, so hopefully um, that will have stirred your interest and a number of questions. Um, so Martin, you're... Are you looking at the mic, Martin? It's going here, but I think it's... Going somewhere else? It's, Not um, you. it's working. Thank you for that. Um, the image, sorry, I, I talk very loud, can anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah good. Um, the image that really struck me there was the one still showing British workmen only, and then in Spanish, I'm presuming that says Spanish workmen. Well, it just says English workers in Spanish, so meaning. Yeah, why, why separate toilet facilities for the two groups of workers? That seems to be not the actions of a progressive, outward looking, multicultural empire. Well, Quite because that because because that was the that was the, the early sixties and the fifties. That's where that's where if you'd gone anywhere uh, in British colonial empire, that's what you would have found. Right. So, progressivism in Spain kicked in around the nineteen eighties, and in the UK sometime in the nineteen sixties. So there's a twenty year difference between these two different progressivisms. What, what, what happened? I tell you what. What happened there, and it's an, I, I think it's an interesting part of our history. In fact, if we go to the next slide, because I might be able to, to yeah. give you a sense of uh, some of the things. The, the, 19, the border closed in 69, and you, you had the loss of, some, I think it was 12,000 Spanish workers who worked in the naval dockyard. Mm -hmm. So you've got to remember that in, in, in the 1970s, and right up till 1984, the main, uh, it was almost seven, no, MOD was almost 70% of the economy. So the economy was a military driven Cold War economy. Which is one of the reasons that you might think that the UK didn't fight that hard to worry about the closed border. Because people still started going on holidays to Spain from UK during the border, closed border years. Is because <laughs> it was a major asset and the Cold War was important and they could afford to keep it going and the economy worked. But by 1972, the trade union movements, which had always been reasonably strong in Gibraltar, um, started taking shape. They had started after the war, because after the war, 
what happened during the war is that there were huge uh, evacuation of Gibraltarians and, fa and their families, some of them here to Ballymena um, and uh, all over the place. And the difficulty was getting back to Gibraltar. So uh, Hassan, who was, uh, I mean, 96% Catholic, Hassan, Jewish leader for 40 years, right? Creates with, with other uh, citizens the Association for the Advancement of Civil Rights, which was really to bring the people back, and that becomes the start of, of Gibraltar politics. When you get to 72, um, there was a general strike, and it was a, it was a strike about parity. So parity meant uh, having the equivalent or near equivalent wage to your person, the same person doing the same job in the UK, and more, more importantly, the same person doing the same job in Gibraltar. The local government initially uh, wasn't sure until it, until it was persuaded by the, the union leaders that, of course, since the bulk of the employment was with the MOD, even though the government would put up its own uh, wages and salaries, the level of tax that would come from the 70% the, the that are working for the Ministry of Defence would more than cover that cost. And actually, that was a boom in a, in a closed border Gibraltar. It was a boom for them. Moroccan workers came over, about 2,200 of them, to fill the gap of plumbers and um, welders and all that. And of course, they, had, they, they were able to, to go back and forth uh, sort of at weekends. I mean, it was a difficult time. And so Morocco stepped in as a, a supplier of food, supplier of workers. Um, but that was, the, that was the, the key point. And after that, basically self-government Increased and it was it was the unfolding. The U, uh, we were defended by the UK quite strongly at the UN when Spain pushed. Uh, it was I mean it was the sixty seven referendum uh, and the fifty four visit by the Queen that were the two elements that led to the closure of the border essentially. They were, and I mean I have to say and I said it to to a group of conservative politicians that, that the other day, but it is very true. We feel very Gibraltarian. We have our national day on on September the tenth, but. Even though sometimes, and not at the moment actually, the Foreign Office has been quite good, but usually the public enemy number one after Madrid would be the Foreign Office. Um, actually, you know, the, 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 the sentiment today, if the Queen called up and said, I'd like to visit Gibraltar, and we all know that that would mean the closure of the border, people would still vote 98% for her to come over, and that's what would happen. That, that there's a very strong bond to that for, you know, for Gibraltarians, and it would be different for people in the UK. But for Gibraltarians, it is a symbol of that democratic revolution that we've had. Um, and always juxtapose that with what was going on in Spain, uh, which was a dictatorship until Franco died. And the border was actually closed m longer after he died, as they tried to resolve themselves, than, than, than before. Because we're all victims of this transition, really, basically, in Spain. Good morning, and tell me. My name is Sean McIntyre. I'm from the North South Ministerial Council Secretariat, so I'm very aware of cross-border, and I have been in Gibraltar and found okay. it unique as well. A few questions. Uh, one of them is related to, uh, is there any delegated powers to, to Gibraltar? Have you any rights to, to come up with anything? The other thing is related to healthcare. We've got so many people crossing the border, and a lot of Spanish. If something happens then, is it automatically in, into the hospitals, is there any issues? And the other thing that I uh, was intrigued about was the black economy uh, and smuggling. I understand the cigarettes, I'm not sure which way it's going. And uh, is that important either to the Spanish economy or, uh, or the Gibraltar uh, economy? So just some yeah. thought for them. I mean, in terms of the, um, in terms of the healthcare, it, at the moment, it's, it's, it's classic EU healthcare. So any person from the EU who trips over as he walks into Gibraltar will go to the Gibraltar hospital and vice versa. Um, for serious cases, uh, we, use, we use some of the Spanish hospitals. Some of them are private hospitals. We pay for it. It's, it's a system, but it's the same system that you'd have from the NHS. Um, so in that sense, the Spanish workers have full EU rights in, in, in Gibraltar when they're in Gibraltar, obviously. Um, the, the, the issue of, of, of smuggling, and that was a very big issue back in the early 90s, um, was driven largely by the, pro the political problems. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a much smaller problem now. I mean, the Spaniards do complain that people buy tobacco from Gibraltar and take it through. 
but we met EU quotas. When, we had, when the Commission came down um, to look at the borders four years ago, they also looked at the issue of tobacco because Spain said, well, if you're looking at the border, you've got to look at this. And so what, what the EU came up with was a reasonable quota for the number of people who visit Gibraltar um, and, uh, and so forth. So we complied with that. Um, I suppose in an ideal world, nobody smokes. You don't have that. that you know, there's, there's always those connotations to those things. But at the peak of it, uh, I, rem I, re I recall uh, one of the mayors from La Linea, who was, I knew quite well, um, said to me he'd just been to one of the houses in a place called Junquillos. Junquillos is one of the, the, the poorest parts of, of, uh, of La Linea. And uh, the old lady sitting there, just under the staircase, she's just got her, her walking stick and pulled back the curtain. It was solid, tobacco. And she said, give my sons jobs, and this goes. And he had no answer for it. You know? so, I'm sorry, I missed it. What was your first question? Yeah. Was related to any delegated powers? Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, we had two constitutions. The first was 69, um, and the second one was 2006. The main difference between the two constitutions is that uh, in the 69 constitution, we had specific powers, and the UK had everything else. We reversed that in the 2006 constitution. I mean, I know that there are probably people in London who think maybe they went too far, they made a mistake, but that's what it is. So uh, foreign affairs, defense, and internal security, meaning security services and so forth, are all specifically UK powers. One of the key things that was reflected in, in our constitution now was that the, um, like a, a lot of places, you had this complex thing of, well, you've got a constitution, but you're in the EU, and the EU is making diktats about your sewage plant or your, uh, the way you run ele you know, electrical safety or whatever. All those powers are specifically d within the constitution given to our ministers. So there is a little bit of complexity as we come out um, in the sense that obviously we're not going to give up uh, those responsibilities. But it, you know, the whole disengagement will, will, will be complicated in terms of uh, legislation. So Gibraltar has Devo Max. Although we're listed in the UN and we're trying to get ourselves delisted um, as, a, as a colony, which was, I think, with sort of good intent, the UK put us down as a, as a colony for decolonization. Um, the reality is that Spain and, the, you know, the, very much like the EU, uh, the UN doesn't really want to get in, involved with uh, tiffs between allies. So. We, we go there every year, um, we say what we say, the Spaniards say what they say, and that's where it stays. You know, that's, that's, that's where that is. A couple of questions on this side. Hi. Uh, I'm Daniel Kelly, and my question is centered on property prices. Uh, there, there will be a very limited supply on the rock. Uh, does this put prices high? And is there any uh, people buying in, in the Spanish side and because it's cheaper and then moving <coughs> eventually to the, to the rock? To, uh, in terms of housing crisis? So in terms of housing? You mean? Yes. Yeah. It, 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 it's been, it, housing was always the biggest issue for Gibraltar. I mean, after the war, when people came back, it was a scrum, and people, until, until, about, 19, uh, until about 1988, really, I mean, there was some housing stock uh, created in, in the 70s. Um, most families were living, you know, three generations in a, in a small council flat, two-bedroom council flat, one-bedroom council flat. I mean, it was really a massive issue, particularly during the closed border. Um, after the border opened, there was a rush of people to live in Spain, even if they sort of technically also kept coming, trying to, to be back in Gibraltar because they would buy at least a weekend house uh, because at least they would be, you know, they'd have space. I mean, for the, for the price of a, of a studio flat in those days, for a, you know, you'd get a, a house with a, with a garden in, in, across the border. Um, and I think the, the Spanish government at the time sort of took, I suppose, a quite sort of open attitude to that because they probably thought, well, the more Gibraltarians who come to live in, in, in Spain, uh, the better. Uh, 
two things have happened since then. The, the government, uh, the, particularly the, the current government, which was in power in the, in the early 80s as well, but it was a socialist government, um, and, and the, uh, in fairness, the, sec- the, the sort of slightly more centre government, invested quite a lot in building housing stock. And the revolution of, of, the, um, of the 90s was we, we, we started the, ni- the 50-50 housing schemes, um, where the government buys half the flat, you can buy the other half, there are conditions on resale and so forth, so you can't just buy it and sell it. You know, you, you won't get anything. It will take a long time before, it, and you can buy your half back. If you, so that creates a, a positive market. The 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 issue was when when again back to Margajo four years ago, uh, he had been a tax lawyer, so he suddenly got into his head um, that if he got really tough on taxation and so forth, um, you know, uh, it would create a problem for Gibraltarians, particularly those who were living in Spain. Now, some of them may have been spending a little bit more time than they, than they might have there, because, simply because the, the house in Gibraltar was so small or they didn't have a house, young people's particularly. So, because the government addressed that issue by, by amplifying the housing stock, um, the impact was actually quite minimal. I mean, there's, a, there's only 139 Gibraltarians who live in Spain and come into Gibraltar. That's, that's the figure. Um, some people have holiday homes. I mean, the wealthier people will tend to have villas and so forth, but then they retire and they, they take up residence and they're there, just as hundreds of thousands of, of expats are. The, 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 the drive now uh, is, the, I mean, the big question mark is where will the EU citizens live? Can we run an economy on an almost closed border? I mean, I think that's the, com- the complex question. But the government policies constantly to try and make it easy for Gibraltarians to, to come back. And Gibraltarians includes EU nationals who they're getting married to, who they're living with and so forth. So it, it's quite a broad, broad church. But it's not the problem that it was 20 years ago when it was, was, was critical. It's a very politicised, as you can imagine, uh, society. We've got, I mean, there's two daily papers, there's a TV station, there's a couple of internet news things that are going all the time. And then one of the issues that I think Spain always underestimated is that when they closed the border, they created a culture which was different. By the time the border opens, you start getting uh, satellite TV and then the internet comes along and so forth. So people in Gibraltar live in their own particular world. Um, the students, we, our policy is still to give grants to students who get places at UK universities. So at any given moment, 900 Gibraltarian students are in London or anywhere else in the UK uh, at different levels of ages. They come back, they still listen to, I don't know, BBC Radio 4 in the morning as well as the local news. Uh, so there's a, that, that, it's a very separate culture to Spain. Spanish newspapers just don't sell in Gibraltar, not because no one lets them in, it's just no one buys them. People who are interested in them read them online. So you've got a, a very aware culture, very plugged into what was happening in the UK as well. And, you know, it's not about us believing in a federal Europe or us thinking that Europe is great. Actually, apart from four years ago when Cameron and the petition called them in, we had had terrible times at the border when it was an EU border, and the EU never took any interest in it. I mean, the EU, I think, has been a very arrogant uh, organization, has to be bludgeoned into doing things for their citizens. And that's probably why people voted Brexit, even if they didn't think it through uh, for, for any other reason. But we've had existential threats quite often. We're not a divided community. We're Latin, so we're always arguing. But we're not divided. And 
when a leader of the opposition and the chief minister and the chamber of commerce and the unions call on the people we're almost a tribe and we respond in that way uh, and, and people you know i mean i was a large part of, of, of helping organize the, the you know, Gibraltar Stronger in Europe uh, campaign. Everybody was going to sign up to that. Why did we do it is probably an important question because we knew that our vote at the end of the day wasn't going to change anything. I mean, the, the likelihood of us being the key sort of uh, swing, I mean, it would have been awful for us in a way if that had been true, if it actually really had been 50-50. Because -50. Um, it, it appears there was no proper limit set you know, to, as to what it would be. I think the, 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 the key thing was that what we knew was that we had to protect our economy, we had to have that sort of force field that we could take Spain to court or fight somewhere, and we have won things. Don't forget that we vote in, voted in, in European elections because we took the British government to the Court of Human Rights in order to establish that we had that right. So we've always been, you know, I mean, you can't play David all the time because that's why it's in the Bible, it doesn't happen all the time, but you can from time to time. That protection, if you like, is a layer of protection that is gone, uh, and it's difficult then to, to, to have a sort of uh, as level a uh, playing field as possible. So the message had to come from Gibraltar to UK and Spain and the EU um, that whatever happened, this is what we thought and what we wanted to protect. Now, since then, I think that the EU has behaved abysmally towards a population that voted 96% to stay um, because it hasn't taken them more than a few weeks to come up with a clause that says we should be you know, part of negotiations and that sort of thing. And I think that's why they're losing the plot. And I think, unfortunately, I think the rest of Europe is going to see that more and more. And, uh, you know, some of Europe will bind uh, like a fist and the rest of it will probably have troubles. There's a man in the second row here who's been trying to... <laughs> uh, good morning, Dominic. Uh, you cited earlier in your talk uh, the example of the Gibraltarian border as being a hard border. Um, I'm not quite clear whether uh, you were indicating that with human supervision it's more efficient uh, and of course one of the things, one of the options we don't have as Michel Barnier has discovered is uh, on our border uh, if we introduce the human factor we also introduce the terrorist factor so are you saying that with automatic uh, mechanisms we can have a hard border as well no, I mean, I, I think I, I did go around the borders here, and in fact, we, we were driving in the car to have a meeting. We went through the border four times without knowing, because we were lost. Um, <laughs> you don't get lost in the Gibraltar border. It's a fence and there's a gap, and there's, and, and there's, there's a control. No, um, what I'm saying is that it's a hard border because it's got, it's in the, it, we've been in the out of the customs union all along. So when you get to that border, you've always had to stop and declare. There's always been two... Two, two positions. One is the, the police post, where you show your passport, and then there's the customs post, where you stop and declare. And the customs post, generally, was where the Spaniards would make life difficult or not. I mean, they went through periods of saying you had to prove that you had everything that was in the, you know, under EU obligatory in your car. So they, you'd open the boot, you'd have to show two triangles and rubber gloves and whatever it was. And that would take five minutes, ten minutes. When you're dealing with thousands of cars, and they tend to be in a burst, it's not that they're spread through the day, even if you add 20 seconds to it, or 10 seconds to it, it very quickly becomes a massive queue. And if it's baking hot, the end of that queue is an hour and a half, two hours. It's, it's, it's horrific. The, the, the point, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I don't know what electronics they're, they're thinking about for, for the border here, but certainly for our border, the electronics still don't go fast enough because it's, I'm sure when you've gone to the airports uh, like Heathrow or in, you, know, you put the passport in, it's not that much faster than somebody going like this. So human intelligence tends to work very well for, for workers coming through. If they all physically have to stop, 
and put their passport onto a scanner, that scanner takes its time. Whilst actually, if the, if the border guard knows them and he sees them every day, and in fairness, you know, the, the Spanish are not you know, that bad most of the time, they will just wave you through and then see someone that they think, well, hang on, show me your passport. So that is the difference. But I, I mean, I don't think, this is why I think we, have, we are completely different. I don't think you can apply that to, to Northern Ireland. But I, and I don't see that the technology is going to arrive um, that can deal with the level of complexity. I think it's, it's, it's overestimating its, its ability. Thank you. Uh, I understand that Saudi Arabia put uh, a huge mosque at the uh, very tip of Gibraltar, uh, a Wahhabi site. Why did they do that? And where is their support in Gibraltar? The, 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 the tall. Um, Little mosque at the end of Gibraltar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was that, that was. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting thing because um, I think it, from from their perspective they were probably looking to uh, historically look back because you know the Gibraltar was considered to be the landing point of, 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 of Spanish sort of you know the conquest of Spain. In fact, there are still Arabs who would argue that since Spain was uh, Arab longer than it was Catholic, it should be <laughs> an Arab caliphate still or whatever. But I don't think they, they came with that sort of intention. I mean, I think that just it's, it's an important spot. They didn't have a proper mosque. Right beside where it is, is the shrine of Our Lady of Europe, which is the, the Catholic shrine built in a mosque, because there was a mosque there originally. Well, we, look, I think we took it, uh, uh, there was a Moroccan population, they wanted to build it. Some people thought it was too tall. The biggest complaint you get is that the imam is a bit noisy when he, he uses the microphone system. But all those things have been sorted now. Um, no one feels particularly upset about it. There is, I think, uh, some division between some of the Muslims themselves. Some of them pref won't go to one mosque and go to another one. Um, but I think that's more to do on the basis of you know, their own religious sort of uh, preferences. But it's, uh, I don't, I, we never saw it as an issue in Gibraltar, to be honest. That was really interesting. It's, it's certainly the history was interesting. Um, I have a double, double question in a way. Did Gibraltar know that they were going to be cited in Article 50 as a possible bargaining chip? And if they didn't, do you think you can trust the present British government not to bring that up again? Um, well, we want, uh, I think the the... the the issue there is obviously we would have probably preferred to have been cited in the letter by the UK side. Our, I think our, our position is that we, the, the British government has a massive portfolio, portfolio. so even with the best of intent, um, unless we're at least in the background telling them watch out for this and watch out for that, they're likely to miss things. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, UK EU officials about 14, 15 years ago, failed to notice that Spain demarcated an area within British waters as an area of special conservation for them to supervise. Once it had been put in and passed through the, published in the, the books, it, it was actually a local um, uh, society uh, for, I think it was the birds or whatever, and I mean, it's a, Natural History Society, whatever, who noticed it, brought it up, and suddenly we had an issue there. So what we say all the time, and in fairness at the moment we have that, um, is that we need to at least be, we don't expect to be at the table, but we need to be there right there, uh, just being able to, to, to get our views across and point out to you know, what, what will happen. And I think the difference between... Um, Spaniards and, uh, and, and, and the British is the British tend to go for this sort of reticent uh, diplomacy and the Spanish just go out there and make it loud um, and to that extent actually you know I quite like Boris Johnson because he's a little bit louder so it's quite useful uh, to have someone who goes out and says what he thinks and I think that's quite important now I also think that it's important that if UK is going to Brexit I mean we can't be the first casualty of Brexit Otherwise, what's it, what, is, what has it been all about? So I think all the MPs, I mean, 
most of the MPs who support us were probably pro-Brexit. So they know that they have a responsibility to make it work as well. Um, that, that includes us. Just one last question up here. Then. Just a quick question. How do you think Brexit will affect the financial services sector in Gibraltar? Um, we've seen cuts in corporate co corporation tax here in the UK. Um, Northern Ireland has been given supposedly a special status to be able to cut its own corporation tax for 12.5% of the size, 10% of Gibraltar. Um, obviously, financial services in Gibraltar are able to work throughout the whole of the EU. If that border is created, what do you believe will happen within Gibraltar itself? I mean, there's two things. One, let's not forget that the physical border could affect the people who work in the industry, and therefore that in itself is an issue. Um, in terms of, 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 of services, as I said, 90% of the financial services actually are going into the, to the UK market from Gibraltar. So our, our, our biggest client is the UK. Um, if you went back 35 years ago, I think Jib was a classic offshore uh, centre, um, sort of brass plate to a large extent. The best thing that happened to us was that the EU started getting strict about financial regulation. And then, um, you know, the IMF, OECD. Over that period, we've come to the same regulation levels as the city, in some cases a little bit more, say, in the gaming industry. And we recognise that because we're a small economy, actually having high standards of regulation is what's going to protect us into the future. Um, you know, other overseas territories have had and continue to have their difficulties. We always sign up if it's, um, say, the, open, the register, we always make it clear we'll be as open as anybody else. As long as there's a level playing field, we'll be there. Um, and that's the commitment that we're giving to the UK government now, that we will keep to their standards. We will have those audited, you know, was, we'll make sure that they, everybody sees that those standards are being maintained. Um, and I think in that scenario, it's really about how intelligent one is in finding new markets. Um, because it's a 10% plus gap that we need to fill, um, will markets into other countries become available, become interesting? I don't know. What we did see at the very beginning was a number of countries uh, sort of, if you looked up at the sky, you saw these vultures coming around uh, who are interested in taking your business. So when you're in that sort of industry, you've got to be very realistic about it. Um, <coughs> if you stop offering something, someone else will offer it. And if you don't keep the standard just right, someone else will come up with something that seems to be a lot cheaper. So it, keeping in, I think in the modern world, it's... You're, you're always going to be better off in a higher standard because eventually you'll get knocked out if, if you don't keep to the standard. Well, maybe just give you a chance for a few last words in summary if you want them, or... Yeah, no, um, thank you. I mean, it, it, I always look with fascination to, to Ireland because I was brought up by Loretta Nuns and Christian Brothers. Um, so I, we, we have a sense of... Uh, of, of, of of what the Irish is. Um, I think Brexit is a massive challenge. And every now and then, we talk about it a lot, you get sick of hearing about it. It hasn't really started yet. Um, and I think institutions like this play a huge role. Um, we've got the equivalents in, in, in our uh, border town, um, and they're very important in creating awareness. And there are pivotal moments uh, that come up that if you haven't had these discussions, they won't take place. Um, and things can get really bad. Uh, and a closed border, I'll leave you with an, an image. I mentioned it last night to Ruth, but um, I, I remember being interviewed about 15 years ago by the Spanish, and somebody in the audience said, all right, but you can't keep going on about the closed border. And I said, I know what you're saying, but um, if you're the bird that was stuck in the cage for 16 years, you feel quite differently to the person who was running around in the forest. Right, well... I think
for a first thing on a Friday morning. That's been a very stimulating uh, hour, and it could have gone on longer, I'm sure. <laughs> Lots of questions. I do hope um, for both our jurisdictions that those who are at the table do take the moral responsibility to make sure our interests are looked after and our voices are heard. And I hope that we will continue to actually now, we've begun a, a relationship at a um, below the official level, I suppose, to actually maintain some of those links and, and to pursue where we have common interests, but also where our interests diverge, but we can give moral support or practical support that we can do that. So again, thank you all for coming out early in the morning. I hope you've enjoyed it, and um, we'll see you at whatever we do next year. Thank you very much.